Now, I'm going to put this on the uh, overhead here, and this is a, a basic view or understanding here on the doctrine, what's called the doctrine of the Trinity. Yeah. And this is the definition of the doctrine of the Trinity. If you look at it very closely here, uh, this is also called the, uh, the Trinity Creed. It's also called the Athanasian Creed. It's got uh, various titles to it for different reasons. But it says simply here, there are three separate and distinct persons in the Godhead. This is the doctrine. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, co-equal, co-eternal, and co-existent. Now, basically, we know what that means. That means that they are equal in power. They are co-equal in eternal. Eternal. That is that they are, uh, they, in fact, the next line sort of spells it out, that they were together all the time and then co-existent. They live together, work together, and so forth. Then it goes on to say in the definition of the Trinity Code here, or the Trinity Creed, as it's also called, never was there a time that one was before the other, and never shall there be a time that one shall be after the other. There is no place that one is that the other is not. Neither is one greater than the other. Neither is anything known to one that is not also known to the other. The Holy Trinity is equally omnipresent, meaning they are everywhere, uh, omnipotent, all power, and omniscient. And this, is, of course, is what is said about God himself, is that he is everywhere, uh, he is all power, and he is uh, all knowing, omniscient, and so forth. And they would say they, the Holy Trinity is equally that. And uh, this is a little bit confusing to people who actually analyze what that definition means and it is even to me and it would be to many of us but this is what was adopted uh, by the early church as a whole in 325 AD this is like uh, 300 years after Christ and uh, they began to fall away and these people in the early church came to the place where that they adopted this. What was happening in the Roman Empire was that the Roman Empire had persecuted the Christians for so long. They had gone through 10 major persecutions over that period of time. And the people had been persecuted so much they began to try to harmonize with the normal citizens so that they would be not be such a standout. And they had leaders who would rise up and say, we will show you a better and a more sophisticated way of doing things and so forth. So finally, whenever Constantine, the emperor who came in power in 313 AD, his mother was a Christian. Constantine had been in a battle and this is so he says that he, as he went into battle, he saw a cross in the sky and he went into battle and won, won the, the battle because he said it was like God saying, I'm going to be with you. And from that time on, he became sympathetic with the Christians, never a convert, but always sympathetic and brought Christianity into the mainstream of the Roman Empire. And his effort to do that, this was in 313, in 325, he called for a council, called the, it was the first ecumenical council. He called all the Christian churches together uh, to a place called Nice. And it is just north of what's today Istanbul, Turkey, just north of that, like on the border of Greece and Turkey, right in there. And he called them all together in 325, and he said, I want you to unify the Christian faith so that we all believe the same thing. There's various beliefs here and there and so forth. And so they begin to hammer this thing out. They had three things that they dealt with at the Nicene Council. They had to deal with the subject of what do we do with people who recanted in times of persecution? And they said, well, no, I'm not a Christian, and they lived. And then afterwards, they want to be back in the church. Do we allow them back in the, in the Christian faith or not? And that was one of the questions. The other was, when is Easter? How do we set the date for Easter? And that was another one of their, uh, on the agenda, things that they had to deal with. Uh, these things were handled very easily, very quickly. The, the third thing was the most difficult, and that is uh, the identity of Jesus Christ. Who was Jesus Christ, really? Who was he? And so this is what they worked on for so long, so hard. 
and they tried to hammer out things, and they came to the place where they could not agree totally on things, and they knew it did not line up with Scripture, and they admitted that it did not line up with Scripture. But in order to bring them all together in unity, they finally agreed on what I'm going to present to you here this morning, which is the, or I should say what I just showed you here, which is called the, uh, the definition of the Trinity Doctrine. <clears throat> and so they were, they were trying to work all these things out. I'm just trying to give you a picture here of how all of this developed. And once that was established, and I can show you this in literature and books and so forth, once that was established, everybody else was considered a heretic outside the church. They were like, you're not in the church anymore, whatever they believe. And so uh, they adopted this, this concept of the Trinity Doctrine, even though it does not logically totally make sense, neither does it line up with the Scriptures, which they admit the word Trinity itself is not even found in the Bible. Uh, and uh, they decided to adopt that, that they could all agree on and so forth. And the emperor pushed for that to be solidified and put his weight behind it and so forth, that they may bring forth the unity because he wanted to bring forth the unity of the entire Roman Empire. And this all happened in the, at the Nicene Council of 325 A.D. In three, uh, I think it was 385 or 383, they had a second ecumenical council. And at that council, they passed a law. This was now the Christian organization and so forth. They passed the law that anyone who did not believe in the Trinity would be a heretic, would be banished, and could be put to death because they did not believe in the Trinity. This is how severe they had become with it. So I'm just pointing out to you how that this became a, a thing that uh, was, was actually a bad thing. And out of that developed what we know of today as the Catholic Church. There were two, two parts of the Catholic Church. There was the Roman Catholic Church, as we know today, and then there's the Orthodox uh, Catholic Church or the Eastern Catholic Church. And, uh, and of course, it is, it is the one that deals with Greece and, and Russia, the Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, uh, Romanian Orthodox, go on and on, Serbian Orthodox. It's the Eastern Church. Uh, they do not have a pope, but they have 12 apostles, men like work as apostles, who are their leaders and so forth. And uh, their doctrines are very similar to that of the Catholic Church. And so later on, these two factions broke apart and became separate. Now, what I want to talk to you here today here is a little bit about this, how this Catholicism came about. Uh, several years ago, I uh, wrote an article, and uh, this is one. This was the first part of it. It has two parts to it, and it's called The Origin of the Trinity Doctrine. In this article here, several pages here, in this article, I, uh, I dealt with the fact that the, uh, that the Trinity doctrine started with ancient Babylon. This is why the Bible has a lot to say about Babylon. And when you get in the book of Revelation, chapter 17 and chapter 18, it talks about Babylon. It talks about Ab Babylon and the, the evil of it and so forth. It's called the harlot church and so forth. It's not just Catholicism that it's talking about. But it is talking about the doctrine of, of polytheism. Polytheism is the belief of the worship of many gods. And that has always been an abomination to God because God did everything. There is one God. I'm going to give you some things in a minute here. But God is God of all. And for us even to begin to shift any of that glory or that praise or that uh, acknowledgement to anything else or anyone else is an abomination to the Lord. That's why, uh, that's why idolatry was an abomination to the Lord. And he even states it in the Word of God, that that's an abomination to him. And so this was that first article. I won't go into detail on this. This was what was established. This is where all uh, polytheism came from. Babylon's where it started. Went from Babylon into Egypt into Greece and uh, the, uh, to the Philistine, I mean, the, yeah, the Philistines as well, uh, Phoenicians, the, the Romans, so forth, until, and they had a multiple line of gods. You know yourself that our planetary system is named after the Roman god system, Jupiter, you know, being the chief god. You got Mars, Venus, you know, and, and our planetary system is named after that even. The Greeks had the same thing, but they had it named differently and so forth. 
And the so same thing with the Egyptians, and same thing with the, but it goes back to Babylon, ancient Babylon. And uh, of course, that's all history. And uh, I can give you much information and, and it's documented. And I've got that in this article. The one that I really want to talk to you though about is, uh, is the one here that is the origin of the Trinity Doctrine as it was adopted by the Christian Church in 325 AD at the Nicene Council. Because when they started looking for a belief about Jesus and about God, they started looking around to what other beliefs had, what they, what they believed and so forth, and they adopted that old belief so that it would appeal to the common man. The Romans could identify with it better and easier. And they felt like there was much wisdom in that. And so they began to go that route. And of course, it brought, sure enough, the Roman Empire all together, and it watered down Christianity to the place that Christianity was no longer what it had been before. The power of God was lost, you know, the power of the early church. Uh, the truth was lost uh, so that people were bound more to the church than they were to God. Uh, they begin to say, we are the people, not of Christ. We are not the people of the Lord, or we do not follow the apostles' doctrine. But they said, we are the people of the creed. They called this the creed, and from that on, that time on, they became known as the people of the creed. I have a couple of history books here uh, that is written. One is just simply says uh, the creed. This is a book, and it's uh, mainly the uh, Greek Orthodox Church. The creed, and it's all about the Trinity the Doctrine. And this is what their whole system is based upon, is what was developed in 325 A.D. at that Nicene Council. It was called the creed. Creed means belief. And it's just a Greek word, coming from the Greek word credo. Uh, this is another book that simply says the people of the creed. The story behind the early church. It wasn't really the early church as we know it from the Bible. It is the early church starting from 325 A.D. and the people of the creed. And I have much more information. I have history books that, would, that my arm could not touch one to the other end, you know, just, and I've studied and read them and so forth. Uh, I want to sort of present some of these things to you here, and uh, I want to show you, first of all, how that what the Lord says. I want you to take your Bibles and go with me to Isaiah 44. I just want to show you here in the Scriptures what the Bible says uh, and uh, about God. I'm going to read, first of all, some from the Old Testament and some from the New Testament, because after 70 A.D., the Gentile world did not respect Israel. Israel had been demolished. Uh, the temple had been destroyed. Jerusalem had been destroyed in 70 AD. The Jews had been captured by the Romans, taken and put into slavery, sold on the auction block down in Egypt, and they were scattered throughout the world. And the Lord said that's what would happen because of their sins and transgressions and their rejection of their Messiah, which was Christ. And so when that all happened, the respect for Israel as a nation or as a people diminished. Therefore, their, their Old Testament, their writings of the Old Testament became a subject of no respect. So that the early Christian church, as time went along, and they began to have their own views and philosophies coming into the picture, they never waited against that Old Testament, what God had to say about himself. And uh, this was a, this was a tragedy. Look, uh, if you would please with me here, if you look in, uh, I'm reading in Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 6. This is some things that the Lord says. I'm going to read a series of verses here to you. Verse 6 says, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his, that is Israel's Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Notice that. And then in verse 8, For ye uh, fear ye not, and neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from the time, and, from, and, and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God beside me. I know not any. Okay? So there's none other beside him. And it goes on to say, I'm reading over here in, in the uh, 44th chapter, in the 24th verse. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, 
he that formed thee from the womb. I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. In other words, nobody else is with him. Chapter 45, verse 5. I am the Lord. And this is all found in just one spot here in, in Isaiah. There's, there's many others. Uh, chapter 45, verse 5. I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside me. Notice that. No God beside me. Verse 6. And they may know that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the, of the west, going down to the west, that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. Uh, also in that 45th chapter, if you look at verse 18. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath, uh, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. Praise the Lord. Verse 21. Tell ye, this is of 45, chapter 45, verse 21. Tell ye and bring them near, yea, let them take counsel together who hath declared this from ancient time. Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. So this God makes himself to be the Savior as well. Jesus Christ, as you know, is our Savior. It's just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. And then verse 22, look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Verse 40, chapter 46, and I'll finish up with this one. Verse 9, remember the former things, this 46, 9, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Praise the Lord. I just read a, just a section of scriptures here where the Lord states emphatically, there's only me, there's nobody else, there's nobody else around and so forth. And yet the Trinity Doctrine came along and said, oh, yes, there are three. And uh, it, was, came, it came about. I'm going to read some of this out of uh, part two. Now, this is the second part of the article I just showed you was the origin of the Trinity Doctrine back in ancient Babylon. This is where it was adopted. This is the article uh, where it was adopted by the Nicene Council here. And this is the part of it, and I'm going to read some of this to you so you get an idea here. What, and just hang in here with me because I've got some other things to give you. How, so you get an idea here of how this early church adopted things because men who began to have influence among the, that early church were people who had gone, to Greek, gone through Greek philosophy. They had studied it, and they tried to adopt some of that Greek philosophy into Christianity. Folks, you can bring nothing more to the truth. The truth is pure. The truth is pure. And we can add nothing to it. Praise the Lord. Everything we need to live for God and serve the Lord, we can find it in this book here. We can find it in the book. You don't have to go outside of the writings of the Lord. And the book here was written by prophets of old in the Old Testament, and they were written by the apostles in the New Testament. Praise the Lord. The Bible said we shall believe on him, Jesus, through through the apostles. Now, let me read this article here to you real quickly here. We shall now see how this Trinity concept of God, referring to this first article here about how the Trinity was developed in the beginning. And then it says here, we shall see now see how this Trinity concept of God eventually seen, seeped into the New Testament church and is now handed down to us in the form of the Holy Trinity. Uh, in the early church, there were warnings. We talked about that. Warnings of apostasy uh, that would come by Christ, by Paul, by Peter, by John, by Jude. They all warned us that would be a falling away. Now, part B here, after the uh, decease of the apostles, there were various church leaders who began to rise up and to lead the church in a direction contrary to the apostles' doctrine, as is mentioned in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. Early Christians' view of Christ now, I'm quoting here from A History of the Christian Church, Volume 1. It says this, The early Christians, including those who had been the most intimate companions, came to cherish very exalted views of Christ. They regarded him as Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One. They called him Kairos, uh, which meant Lord, indeed. The only creedal affirmation which seems to have been asked of the first convert, converts was subscribed in the declaration, Jesus is Lord. 
That's it. He's Lord. And when they said Jesus is Lord, here's what it says below that. While to those reared in Greek or non-Jewish or uh, oriental backgrounds, this term would bring to mind the many lords of the mystery religions. To those with a Jewish heritage, the word kairos was the Greek term employed for the Hebrew Adonai, which meant God himself. So when the Jews would say to Jesus, thou art Lord, they were saying you are the Messiah, and to say he's the Messiah would say he is God himself, because the Bible says his name should be called Emmanuel, uh, which means God with us, you know, and so forth. And so the name, uh, all kind of scriptures, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. His name should be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mind of God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. All of those things that they knew was there so that the Messiah was indeed God himself among men. <clears throat> those want to say these first Christian uh, century uh, Christians did not attempt to answer all the questions which Christians would invariably rise as they struggled with the problems presented by this unique and charismatic person whom they had come to know. In other words, it's saying simply here, and this is taken from the scriptures here, that they had not dealt, did not deal with things that would eventually arise. Can I just say this? The way we deal with things that arise and so forth against Christ and against truth is say we stay with the truth. I uh, was in a bank one time years ago, and a woman said, "You want to see a, you want to see a counterfeit twenty-dollar bill?" Excuse me. <coughs> one of the women that worked in the bank. I said, "Yes," and so she showed it to me, and I said, "You know, if I were to have this bill, I said I'd just figure it's a regular twenty-dollar bill." And she says, "I know," but she said, "This actually is a counterfeit." I said, "How do you know it's a counterfeit?" And she says, the way we know, and she was the one in that bank who always determined whether a bill was counterfeit or true. Anything that was in question, it was brought it to her. She says, the way you know a counterfeit is to study the real. You study the real, and you know the real with all backwards and forwards. And then you can spot a counterfeit. You don't study the counterfeit. You study the real. Everybody still with me? You study the real thing. If you study the real word and you study the truth and you know the word and you get it in your heart, folks, it will counteract any counterfeit that comes your way. You'll say, no, 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 that's not what the Bible is. No, 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 that's against Scripture. You see what I'm saying? So you study the real thing. Let me read on here. Church leaders influenced by Greek philosophy. In the second, third centuries, widely divergent views of the relation of Jesus to God were put forward. And there were ideas. Some, including the convert Justin, Justin was probably the beginning of it, whose spiritual pilgrimage had led him through Greek philosophy to Christ, who had become acquainted with views of the Logos, which were akin to those taught by Philo. Philo was a, was a Jewish philosopher who lived in Egypt, well-educated, and had a lot of influence upon the Jews that were still in Egypt at this time. I have his book. There's a book that he wrote and so forth. I have the book on Philo. Who held the who held that the Logos to be the second God. So he sort of believed in there was two gods. Uh, Tertullian, this was another one of those church leaders that came around, believed in the monarchia, a solo government of God. As to the monarchians, so to him, to him God is one. In other words, this is how he believed in connection with God. Tertullian employed the Latin word substantia. In other words, whenever he was, he was a Roman, so he used Latin language and he was a lawyer and he pulled out some fancy words that were among the, the uh, Latins that were not among the Greeks and some of the others. And so consequently, he used the word substantia. And substantia, uh, we know is from which the word substance comes from, is also the word that he began to use, taken from Roman legal terminology uh, and meaning a man's status in a community. He declared that in his substantia, that is God's substantia, or substance, God is one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so that they are all part of the same substance. You know, So Tertullian said there are three personae or parties, that have their place in the economy or the administration activity of God. They are seen in the government through which monarchy of the rule of one God operates. Here is a unity of substantia, but a unity distributed to a trinity, a unity of substance, but a trinity in form and in aspect. 
there, there as in his use of stancia and persona, Tertullian uh, uh, contributed to later creeds through which the Catholic Church would express their faith in this creed. And so it goes on to say, it talks about one named Clement, and uh, said he had been a native to Athens. It seems certain that he was born a pagan and that he was reared in the atmosphere of Hellenistic culture. Hellenistic is, Jew, is Greek culture and, uh, and thought, process of an eager and inquiring mind. Clement appears to have conformed gladly to the electric temper of the Grecian Roman world of his day. He dipped into the various philosophical schools with which he came into contact and read extensively in some of them, notably in Platoism. Plato was one of the philosophers of Greece and goes on to say, talk about the origin was another one. Origin was born in Christian Paris, probably not from the, in the year of 185. He was introduced by his father in the scriptures to Greek learning after his father's death. Origin continued his study of Greek literature and in part earned his living by teaching it. He lived with extreme asceticism, curtailing his hours of sleep, giving himself exclusive to the uh, catechismal school and to the continued study of the scriptures of Greek philosophy, including Neo-Platoism. Uh, a, su a superb teacher, he had a profound influence upon his students from them and through the writings of And he goes on to talk about this. I'm not going to read everything here, but he goes on to talk about how that he began to influence them and they came up with a different, a little bit different form. So they had different forms about how the God was connected, I mean, Jesus was connected with God, but he was not altogether just the only God. And finally, it goes on, and I say here, in general, this was the beginning of the falling away period mentioned by Paul that was to come. And then I talk about the Nicene Council here, and I'm not going to read all this to you. But it was, uh, he called it together, the purpose of the, con of the, of the, of the council, I've already explained to you and talked to you about it. And it goes on to say here the different things that were done, and I'm quoting here from different books and articles and things that are not articles, but books of history books that I've read and everything. And when they finally got down to the end of it and everybody was squabbling, everybody was saying, this is what I believe, this is what I believe, this is what I believe. They were trying to come together in some kind of form of a unity because they believed some of them in Trinity in different ways, a triune God system in certain ways. And the triune God thing, folks, goes back into ancient times and is found in every religion in the world. It, you can find it, and, I, and that's in that first article that I showed you here. But it's found there. It's, it's, in, uh, it's in Zoroastrianism, it's in uh, Shintoism, it's in Buddhism. You know, all of those old religions in the, in the, far, in the far East, there's a trinity or triune God system. They have names for them and so forth. And they're all there. What I'm trying to say that it was nothing new under the sun. So when they came to the place of the Nicene Council, they started trying to draw some kind of belief that they could all come together. And they finally came to the agreement that what they were going to agree on was not scriptural. Was not scriptural, but it brought unity to the group. And that's what they finally, and when the, and when, when the emperor saw that, the emperor said, then let's go that way. Let's go for it. Because I, I want this to be a, a unified thing. He was more interested in unity than he was in truth. And so in the midst of all that, it was lost. That was one of the beliefs. Let me just throw this out for what it's worth. One of the beliefs that they really contend with was a belief called Arianism. A fellow by the name of Arius believed this. And he believed there was two. He believed there was God. And then God had created a second God. That was, you know, that was not co-eternal with him. And he had created him. That was Jesus Christ. And so he said that he created the second God. And the second God was the first one. And then with that God, he created all things and so forth. Trying to tie it in with some other scriptures and so forth. This is why in the Trinity doctrine, they say co-equal, co-eternal, co-existent. There was our time that one was before the other. That was refuting Arianism. And they actually, uh, it was a doctrine that sort of fell by the wayside. They condemned it and so forth. The Jehovah Witnesses picked up that doctrine. That's what they believe. If there's anybody here that has been or you, you are even today, 
forgive me if I refer to them because I don't usually speak about different religions and denominations in the pulpit. You know that. But uh, Jehovah Witness adopted that. So they believe in one God. They do not believe in the Trinity. They believe in one God and they believe that Jesus Christ was a little God or he was a brother to Michael the Archangel. Or some of them believe he was Michael the Archangel. I think it was. They believe he's Michael the Archangel. And that Satan was like a brother. And then and Satan was, you know, cast out. And so forth. Weird stuff. But nevertheless, they believe that Jesus... That's why they say we're not Jesus' witnesses. We are Jehovah's witnesses. I was up in Washington, D.C. there here a few years ago. And uh, standing out. And it was at Christmas time. And hardly nobody was around. And just a few people out. And a guy was out in front of the... You know, the White House with the, the fence and all. And he was passing out tracts. And there was a Joe Witness guy. And so he, I said, he said, uh, hey, how are you doing? I said, and I started talking to him. He said, I'm Joe Witness. I said, yeah, I, I picked up on that. I said, I'm a Jesus Witness. I'm a Jesus Witness. You're Jehovah's Witness. I'm a Jesus Witness. Jesus said, go ye all the world and preach the gospel, you know. We are wit you should be witnesses of me in Judea, Samaria, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and into the uttermost part of the world. That's what we are. We are Jesus' witnesses. We're witnesses of Jesus Christ. They say we're not witnesses of Jesus Christ. We're witnesses of somebody greater than Jesus Christ. There is nobody greater than Jesus Christ because God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Praise the Lord. And anyhow, I just want to throw that out. That was Arianism. And as a whole, they rejected that doctrine. But the Jehovah Witness, as a religion, did finally eventually pick up on it and they use it themselves. And that's what they believe, if you ever wonder about it. If you ever say, oh, we don't believe in the Trinity, the Jehovah's Witnesses say, yeah, we don't believe in the Trinity either. But they do believe in, in two gods, one's greater, one's inferior, one's less, and so forth. And uh, I won't go any further than that. Let me, uh, let me just take a moment here. I'm trying not to bore you to death here. But let me take a moment here and talk to you about some scriptures where Jesus stated himself to be the mighty God. Or it lets us know that he was that one God that Isaiah talked about. Isaiah, you know, Isaiah recorded where God said, I alone, there's none beside me, I know not any, you know. And all you got to do is just say, put a ring around it, it's in the word, I believe it, and that settles it. Praise God. And we can have all the discussion, and we can have all the, the arguments, and we can have all the debates, and you can go on and on and on and on and on. On about it, but the word says God is one. Praise God. And uh, let me show you here some scriptures here that I'm going to leave with you here. If you go to First Timothy 3.16, some of these, some of you, many of you know them very well, but uh, let me just refer to them again here. This is First Timothy 3.16, Paul writing. And he says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in flesh. And that was open. so if God is one God, then that one God was manifest in flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world and received up in the glory. Praise the Lord. And another scripture that I'll read to you is one found in Colossians chapter two, verse nine. For in him, in Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Think about it. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And it was just this very simple verse. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 19. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Not imputing their trespass, trespasses unto them. And hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And he was Jesus Christ. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself reconciling is bringing them back into his favor and bringing them back into his fold and so forth and he and, and then it goes on to say that we have been committed the word of reconciliation folks the words that we have and the message we have to the world is that that will bring them back in favor with god and get them ready for heaven praise the lord we have the greatest job on the face of the earth the church does Amen. Love it with all your heart. All you folks that have, uh, you have jobs in the church and you work and you have different ministries that you do. God bless you for that. And uh, God will honor you for that because you're helping other people 
to be reconciled to, to Christ. And to be reconciled to Christ is to have all those sins washed away, is to have their lives back on course with God. And one day we'll hear the trumpet sound and we'll rise to meet him in the air. Praise the Lord. Everybody say praise the Lord. Praise Let me move on here very quickly here. Uh, this is John uh, 14. St. John 14. This is Jesus speaking. Verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And, uh, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And he's been talking about the Father. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Seen him. The Father. Now Jesus talked about the Father. Somebody said Jesus talked about the Father because the Father was a different person. No, he talked about the Son, the Son of Man, in the third person. That didn't mean he was another person. You know, third person meaning in, in the sense that he talked about it as them and not by, about himself. You don't want to say what, first person, second third, third person. English, you know. Uh, so Jesus would talk about God in the third person, the Father in the third person. But he talked about the Son in the third person. He said, the Son of Man hath no place to lay his head. Who's he talking about? He's talking about himself. The Son of Man hath no place to lay his head. Foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man hath no place to lay his head. He talked about himself as the, as the man Christ Jesus. That's why often he would talk about the Son of Man as the flesh. The Son of God, praise the Lord, was God in the flesh, praise the Lord, and it was begotten of God. Because God overshadowed Mary, Mary conceived of the Holy Ghost, which is God, that's the Spirit of God. God is a spirit. Oh, God overshadowed Mary, she conceived of the Holy Ghost, and Jesus came forth. And when Jesus came forth, he was the Son of Man because he was the Son of Mary. He was also the Son of God in that he was conceived of the Holy Ghost or conceived of God. He was also God because God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. God could not die on Calvary, but the, call, the price of forgiveness of sins was that of the shedding of blood. So he said to David, a body thou hast prepared for me, that it would come forth from Mary. And so when Mary then gave forth a, a body, and God inhabited the body of Jesus Christ, so that Jesus Christ was both God and man. As man, he suffered. As man, he hungered. As man, he thirsted. Uh, you know, as man, uh, he was tempted in all manner like as we, yet without sin. But as God Almighty, he healed the sick. He opened the blinded eyes. He did the work that he did. Praise the Lord. So you're not talking about uh, one, one God that has three different heads or three different people or persona or three different individuals involved in it. You have Jesus Christ who, ha who is it all. Praise the Lord. All in Christ. So I'm just reading this verse of scripture here to you. Look at this sixth verse again. Jesus said unto them, this is John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Can I just say one thing? It's not Mohammedism. It's not Buddhism. It's no other way, folks. Only through Jesus Christ. you got your Bible. Put a line under that. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. you got to come by the way of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. In verse 7, if you had known me, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. And Philip, verse 8, saith unto him, Lord, show us the father and it sufficeth or satisfies us. And <clears throat> look what Jesus said in verse 9. Jesus saith unto him, have I been so long time with you and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the father. Look at that. No, but because this is all that you'll ever see of the Father. The, God is the Spirit. Okay, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And how sayest thou, then show us the Father? Then he goes on to say in verse 10, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Praise the Lord. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. And while we're talking about it, what does it mean the Father's in me? Okay, God, the Spirit is in Christ. The fullness of Godhead, Godhead dwelt bodily in Christ, the Bible says. 
And so, if that's the, the case, then how is it that, that, uh, that Jesus is in God? Well, let's take, suppose we had one light in this building, one bulb up here, and it was dark, and we put that, we turned that one light on, that one bulb, and that light from that bulb filled this whole place, all for we could see. It was light in here. All right? The light's in the bulb, but also because the room is full of light, the bulb is in the light. You understand what I'm saying? Jesus said, I'm in the Spirit, the Spirit is in me. Because just as the Spirit is in him, so also was the Spirit everywhere. It went out from him. Do we grasp that? Do we understand that? You know, understanding that Jesus Christ was God Almighty is a very important thing. This is what uh, Jesus said to, uh, uh, and I think it was Peter who responded to it, Matthew chapter 16, whom do men say that I am? Then he said, whom do ye say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And when he said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, he was saying, you are God Almighty manifest in flesh. And Jesus said, flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Now, I, I tell you that because I want you to, to know that it also comes in many times, and I, I know some of our people even believe this is the only way it comes it, by revelation, that God has to show you that all of God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. That scripture in Isaiah 9, 6, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. We're talking about the, the, the son, the born, you know, the, the child is born, the, the son given. His name should be called the mighty God, the everlasting father. It's all right there in Isaiah 9, 6. Well, did Isaiah make a mistake? Did he mess up there? I mean, did somebody misinterpret that? What happened? Yeah, no, it's all right. And he also says his name should be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. This was all, praise the Lord, that one God in Christ, not a triune God system. That would make heathens say, oh, we can identify with that because we believe in Jupiter, we believe in Zeus, we believe in, you know, Pluto, we believe on and on and on, all these different gods out here. No, 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 no. Jesus Christ was the mighty God and in him is everything. Praise God. And Jesus went on here to say that if you've got the Father, you've got it all. Praise the Lord. Uh, I'm going to read these other two verses very quickly here. If I were to turn back in John uh, to chapter 12 and verse 45. It says, Jesus said here, and he that seeth me seeth him that sent me. Jesus saith that. But back up to the 10th chapter uh, of that same spot, uh, that same book, I mean, John chapter 10 and verse 37, 38. If I do not the works of my father, believe me not, verse 38. But if I do the works of his father, he says, through though ye believe me not, believe the works that ye may know that, that and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Praise the Lord. And we could, and there are other verses of scripture and lets us know that the Lord, praise the Lord, is the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Folks, isn't truth a wonderful thing? Praise the Lord. And when you know it and when God has given that understanding to you, it's not that we are arrogant, high-minded and said, oh, we know more than those people back then and so forth. It's just that Greek philosophies that they encountered and studies of Plato and all of that stuff blinded them. It blinded them to the simple truth. The Bible talks about the simplicity of the gospel. Praise the Lord. It's so simple. And God will let us know what is truth if we love him and we want to walk with him and serve him. Praise God. Let's stand together. Let's worship God and let's just thank him here today for his love, his goodness, and his mercy to us all. Would you raise your hand and worship God? Lord, we love you. We thank you, Jesus. Bless this audience this morning. Bless our morning service. Bless the word of God to our hearts and lives. God, we ask you to touch it with a touch from heaven. We praise you and magnify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, praise the Lord, East Wind. It's good to have everybody with us today. We just want to welcome you to this week's online broadcast. And we know that God's got something special for you today. 
the Word of God can penetrate your heart, do a great work in you. And we're just so thankful that we have this time to come together. We want you to mute all of your electronics right now and get ready to have church. Gather your family around and let's worship the Lord together. God bless. Break into the wild and don't be afraid. Mm. Run into wide open spaces, grace is waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted, grace is waiting. Where the spirit Shake at the sound of Jesus' name. Lives made whole, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name. Say chains, chains will fall. Prison shake at the sound of Jesus. Every name. life made whole, lives made whole, hearts awake at the sound of oh, Jesus' every name. Chain Dead. Grace is waiting. Dance 
like the weight has been lifted Grace is waiting for you Dance like the weight has been lifted Because grace is waiting for you
belongs to you. Oh, it belongs to you, Jesus. My hallelujah belongs to you. My hallelujah, my hallelujah belongs to you. Hallelujah, Jesus. Jesus. We deserve the glory, Lord God. Hallelujah, Jesus. We give you all the glory, Lord. You deserve it all. Hallelujah. You deserve all the glory. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise your name, Lord. Hallelujah. We are so glad that you have joined us online today here at East Wind. And before we continue with announcements and the Word of God, We want to worship God through giving. And we have a few ways that you can give today online. You can give digitally at give.eastwind.church or you can use the app called Tithely, that is tithe.ly or you can give via text to 321-339-1333. Also, as you prepare to give, don't forget, today is the first Sunday of the month, which means it is Go Sunday. And together, through our faithful giving to go, we are continuing to make an impact in our church, our community, and our world. We miss not being able to gather together today, but we will resume our regular scheduled services with Midweek Prayer and Word this Wednesday at 7 p.m. and with morning worship services at 8.30 a.m. and 10.45 a.m. and evening worship at 6.30 p.m. next Sunday. So make plans to worship with us either online or in person this week. Due to our services being moved online, we will not begin our Next Steps classes until next Sunday at 10 a.m. So there is still time for you to join. If you want to learn more about East Wind, who we are, and how you can get connected, then sign up to join our Next Steps Connect class today by visiting connect.eastwind.church. Again, thank you for joining East Wind this morning. And we invite you to join us again tonight for another powerful online service with worship and a message from Pastor Myers. But now, let's prepare our hearts for the Word of God as we present a message that was preached over two years ago entitled, The Beauty of Ashes. How many of you think that apostolic Pentecostals ought to have more fun than anybody else in the world? We have more fun. We don't have hangovers. We don't have to go to rehab centers. Come on, somebody. You can get high on God today. And everything from this point forward will be a blessing, not a curse. My. Love this great church and all of the families, those that are here present and others that have been here in the years past. What a great group of apostolics it is to belong. I'm so thankful for the family of God. Amen. Aren't you thankful? I know you are. Jeremiah 31 and 40. Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 40. Jeremiah 31, 40. And the whole valley, everybody say the whole valley. valley. Of the dead bodies and of the ashes and all the fields under the brook of Kidron, under the corner of the horse gate toward the east shall be holy unto the Lord. It shall not be plucked up nor thrown down anymore forever. God can even take land that everybody else has neglected and say, this is holy unto me. Nobody's going to be plucked down. This land's not even going to be thrown down anymore. It's going to be holy. The ashes and the dead bodies. Also looking at Isaiah chapter 61, reading verses 3 and 4. Isaiah 61, 3 and 4. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion. Everybody say folks that are in the church. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion. To give unto them beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That they might be called trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord. That he might be glorified. And they shall build the old wastes. They shall raise up the former desolations. And they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. 
There are places that have been desolate for many generations. And God can make something beautiful out of it. You say, well, my dad was an alcoholic. My granddad was an alcoholic. My great granddad was. You don't have to be an alcoholic. You can be holy unto God. Woo, my. I want to speak to this morning from verse 3. And I want to speak on this subject. The beauty of ashes. Turn to your neighbor and say, the beauty of ashes of ashes and you may be seated thank you for standing ashes in the word of God was not often looked at in a positive light in fact when they would mourn the loss of a loved one the Bible says that they would robe themselves in sackcloth and ashes and even in Genesis 18 as Abraham is describing his lowly state as a human in the presence of God he says in verse 27 behold now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord which am but dust and ashes Abraham in describing the dichotomy between a human being standing in the presence of the mighty God says that I recognize that I am but dust and ashes dust and ashes is the description of our frail humanity you say well I'm still young and strong pastor I don't feel like dust and ashes you just live long enough <laughs> after a while it'll catch up with you and your mind will be writing checks that your body can't catch but ashes in this context is not only representing something of low estate. It is also a representation of something that was. Something that has been destroyed. Something that may have been of value at some point. But is not now. It has a past, but no future. May have been great at one time, but now it's just a heap of ashes. And it is over. It is final. Well, that's the way that man thinks, but that's not how God thinks. Because, ladies and gentlemen, our God likes to make something out of nothing. I love the verse in the Bible that said, He hung the earth on nothing. <laughs> I mean, you can't even hang a picture on the wall without having to get all the proper tools and the hooks and the this and the that and the the anchor bolt and just to hang a picture and God takes the universe and just flings it out there and hangs it on nothing what a mighty God we serve so this whole notion that you've done too much that God can't use you is a lie from the pit of hell because I've got a God that can make ashes beautiful when everybody else says it's all over, he'll never be nothing, she'll never be nothing, their life is over. It's not over until God says it's over. And I'm so thankful that I've got the hope of heaven that you can believe in God, you can trust in God, and regardless of what may be in your past, there is a God that can take nothing and make something beautiful out of it. Hallelujah. In Exodus chapter 9, as Pharaoh is battling Moses in the release of the Jewish people, God says to Moses and Aaron in verse 8, and I quote, Take to you handfuls of ashes of the furnace, and let Moses sprinkle it toward the heaven in the sight of Pharaoh. I just like that little phrase right there. I'm going to do something and I want Pharaoh to see it. So I want you guys to take your little handfuls of ashes and I want you to just go and stand before Pharaoh. Pharaoh's in this big, beautiful court, most powerful nation, the Pharaoh, the most poor, powerful man in the then known world. We've got all the guards and all the magicians and all the people. And here's Moses and Aaron standing before Pharaoh with their little handfuls of ashes. 
What are you guys doing? What do you got now? We're just obeying God. Here we stand. I'm going to tell you what, God will make you do some stuff that you'll feel like you're going to make a total fool out of yourself. But if you'll just obey God, God will make something out of nothing. You say, oh, I don't think God could ever use me. You have no idea God's going to use you and make something beautiful out of your testimony. You say, but I don't have a great pedigree. I don't have all this stuff to point to. All God needs is a willing vessel, somebody that will obey God and say, Lord, if you can use anyone, you can use me. What are you guys going to do with that? We're just going to follow what God said. And they just sprinkle it toward heaven. Just throw it up in the air. Ashes. Verse 9 says, And it shall become small dust in all the land of Egypt, and shall be a boil breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beasts throughout all the land of Egypt. And they took ashes of the furnace and stood before Pharaoh. And Moses sprinkled it up toward heaven, and it became a boil breaking forth with blames or scars upon man and upon beast. And the magicians, and I'm not sure how all this happened. I don't know if they were called into the courtroom to, to try to you know, put a spell on, on Moses and Aaron and make sure that this thing didn't actually become what they said it was going to become. But whatever it was, the magicians were neutralized. They could not stand before Moses because of the boils. This is something else I like about God. He does an instant work. They're like, come on, magician, come in here and tell these guys, show them who's got the real power. And they're like, we can't walk. They can't even get out there. They can't even stand before Moses because they're covered with boils. For the boil was upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. I'm going to tell you something right now. You and I live this life worried too much about the enemy. Well, I don't want to pray out loud because I'm afraid the devil will hear me. That's why you do need to pray out loud. The devil does need to hear you. He needs to hear you say, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He needs to hear you say, there is none that is like unto you. You are the mighty God and the everlasting Father. There is no reason for an apostolic Pentecostal to be afraid of the devil. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The Lord will neutralize the enemy. They're not going to be your problem. You say, wow, power of God is revealed now because he can make something out of nothing. He just took these ashes, turned something into it. So it is revealed at this point that there is this miraculous transformation that takes place when even ashes are in the hands of obedient servants. But the end result is a plague of boils. It's not exactly the end result that we were looking at. Boils are not necessarily beautiful. But we do see early on that God can take ashes and turn it into something. Then we read in the book of Leviticus, God introduces something to the children of Israel that's called the law of the burnt offering. Twice in the book of Leviticus, once in the fourth chapter and once in the sixth chapter. He instructs the priest to take the ashes from off the altar. When a sacrifice has been burnt for a trespass and it is taken now, as the Lord instructs, to a clean place in the camp. He said, I want you to take the ashes from the altar and take it to a clean place. Don't discard it. Don't throw it away. Don't go and bury it. Take it to a clean place. Apparently, although the ashes represent what has been given as a sacrifice, ladies and gentlemen, it still has some future value. Oh, hallelujah. I love the way God works. 
it still has some future value, though you and I may not be able to represent it or be able to even recognize it. So this is the first hint that we get of the forthcoming resurrection of the sacrificial lamb. Because when they crucify Jesus and they execute him in a public humiliation and put him on a cross and he suffers and eventually the Bible says gives up the ghost, they take his body and they put it in a tomb and they seal the tomb and they put a roaming guard in front of the tomb. But on the third day, when everybody else has walked away because surely there's no more value, it's just a carcass. But I'm thankful that there were some people that still came to the tomb to make a sacrifice. To bring their sacrifice of praise. To bring the oil and the ointments. They recognize it's not over when man says it's over. Because the guard was gone and the tomb was rolled away and there was an angel sitting on the rock. (laughs) Sitting on top of the stone. (laughs) Who are you looking for? He is risen. He is not here. something beautiful that's going to come out of that crucifixion it may have just looked like some sort of a public shaming of an individual that shouldn't have rose up against the temple and against the pharisees and against the hierarchy but you know what it's going to represent something beautiful it's not just a carcass it's not just a representation of what we had in the past it is the power of the future and then we read in Leviticus chapter 6 and verse 6 as we pick up this narrative and he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord a ram without blemish out of the flock with thy estimation for a trespass offering unto the priest and the priest shall make an atonement for him before the Lord and he shall be forgiven him for anything of all that he hath done in trespassing therein the Lord spake unto Moses saying command Aaron and his son saying this is the law of the burnt offering because of the burning upon the altar all night Unto the morning and the fire of the altar shall be burning in it. And the priest shall put on his linen garment. And his linen breeches shall he put upon his flesh and take up the ashes which the fire hath consumed with the burnt offering on the altar. And he shall put them beside the altar. He's even got the priest putting on their linen garments when they handle the ashes. Why are we putting on our good clothes to handle the ashes? I know some of you men are not like this, so I'll just talk about myself. (laughs) My wife gets on to me because she's like, if you're going to clean the garage, you can't do it in your dress clothes. You gotta change pants, you gotta change shirts, you're like da da da. I'm like, I know, I know, I want. But I'm gonna be really careful. <laughs> that never works, does it? <laughs> you, you end up spilling bleach, you end up getting something on, you're like, I told you you shouldn't have had on your good clothes. You would think the priests would put on their bad clothes, not their linen garments to handle ashes. What's up with that? And he shall put off his garments. Okay, now we're changing clothes. And put on other garments and carry forth the ashes without the camp. Now think about this. You've got to have on your linen garments, which represented the power of the priesthood, when you take the ashes from the altar. That's a little something you need to put in your brains because we're going to pull that back out in just a moment. What makes the ashes beautiful is the fact that they came from the altar. And then he says, carry him forth the ashes without the camp into a clean place. When the Lord has given instructions on how to move the tabernacle in the wilderness, he says this in Numbers chapter 4 and verse 12. He said, I want you to take all of the instruments of ministry. You know, they had this tabernacle. They had to set it up and they had to put everything in place in the wilderness And then they had to move when the Lord said to move. And then they had to gather everything up there in a proper way. Everything had to be packed a certain way and carried a certain way. He said, I want you to take all the instruments of ministry wherewith they minister in the sanctuary and put them in a cloth of blue, blue garment. That was a a garment of of cost. Cloth of blue because the way they had to dye and all that. And cover them with a covering of badger skins and shall put them on a bar. And they shall take away the ashes from the altar. 
Oh, okay, these were probably just buried somewhere. No, and spread a purple cloth thereon. Purple was the color of royalty. Even in the book of Acts, when they said they, they witnessed to Lydia, and she was saved, the Bible said she was a seller of purple. She was a well-to-do lady renowned. She was able to make the proper dyed garments. This is what the Roman Empire even used for their governors and so forth. They would wear purple. And the Lord says, I want you to spread out the purple cloth. For the ashes. Gets even better. Verse 14. And they shall say, or they, they shall put upon it all the vessels thereon. Wherewith they minister about it, the censers, the flesh hooks, the shovels, the basins, all the vessels of the altar. And they shall spread it upon it, a covering of badger skins and put to the staves of it. That's the long poles to carry. And when Aaron and his sons have made an end of covering the sanctuary and all the vessels of the sanctuary, as the camp is to set forward after that, the sons of Kohath shall come to bear it. Now watch this. But they shall not touch any holy thing. Ladies and gentlemen, with all of these instruments of ministry is ashes wrapped in a purple garment that God says is holy so holy that man should not touch it lest they die think about that these ashes are considered holy say what does that have to do with me today ladies and gentlemen we all have ashes in our life In fact, Job says it this way, our remembrances are like as ashes. We have those remnants and memories of wrong choices and mistakes. We try to get them out of our mind and off of our hands, but yet they linger still. Those things that caused us pain, those things that we remember at night and we don't often say anything about it, but... It's inescapable. We see it as a curse. An irrevocable reminder of some less than favorable moment. But what we never saw was that those ashes could be considered holy unto God. You thought you would have to just deal with it all your life. You thought you'd have to just find a place in the mind of a human being to bury it but you can it keeps coming back i've come to preach to somebody today that god's gonna make something beautiful out of those ashes he doesn't need to wipe the slate clean he can take the pain of your past and give you victory to tomorrow he will take those things that have scarred you and he will make something beautiful out of it so that it becomes holy so i never saw those things that i went through as being something beautiful and without god it's not but with god It represents the transforming power of God. A power that is so great that he can make the ashes beautiful. That he can turn mistakes into miracles. That he can turn problems into promises. Mourning into joy. Trade a garment of heaviness for a garment of praise. So I say to you today, bring everything to the altar. All of your past, all of your experiences, good, bad, and ugly. Bring them all and put them on the altar. Because God's going to make something beautiful out of it. God's going to give you a testimony. And you're going to be able to rise up and say, once I was lost, but now I'm found. Once I was blind, but now I see. There's beauty coming out of these ashes. There's something beautiful coming up out of these ashes.
We read Jeremiah 31, 40 in our text, and the whole valley of the dead bodies and of the ashes and all the fields under the brook of Kidron unto the corner of the horse gate toward the east shall be holy. The whole area. Let me tell you something. God can save one person. And it doesn't stay confined to just that individual. He make the whole area, the whole family, the whole neighborhood. It shall not be plucked up nor thrown down anymore forever. The entire area of wasteland is going to be holy ground. I was telling the folks in the earlier service today, I remember a few years ago when we went down to Porta Plata, Dominican Republic, and we were building a church in a really terrible neighborhood. I mean, it was all kinds of drug lords and pimps, prostitutes. It was everything you can imagine. In fact, they even told us when you're working on the church, don't leave the immediate surrounding. Don't even go over to the next block. It's too dangerous. When we were actually dedicating the church service, the bus was parked right next to the church. They broke into the bus, destroyed, cracked all the windows during the dedication service. That's how rough of an area it was. We went in there and built a church in the roughest possible area of an area that was already pretty rough. Brother George Long, you remember, don't you? Boy, him and I got down in a neighborhood that just went down into a really tiny, narrow, dead-end area. And I said, I got to get out of here. This place looks too dangerous. He was trying to follow me, and I was in a little truck with a stick shift. We had a bunch of people in our truck. We were trying to find a restaurant. We got in an area we weren't supposed to be. And boy, I took off trying to get down out of that neighborhood, and guys with sweatpants and guns started jumping on the back of the truck. And they started yelling. People in the truck were saying, but brother George Long is still back there. I said, too bad for him. He's going to have to find his own way out. (laughs) Getting out of this place. (laughs) Those guys with guns in their belts, they started knocking on the back glass. I I figured I'd just drive crazy and knock them off. They were knocking on the back of the glass and all that. And guys in the back seat were looking around. They're like, they're hollering at us. I'm like, what are they saying? They're saying your friend is still back there. I said, I know that. He'll come eventually. I said, we got to keep moving. Finally, we got to an area where we thought they, one of them guys jumped off that truck. They were hanging on for dear life. Had pistols stuck in the waistband of their sweatpants. And I thought, this is it. It's all over. They said, are y'all with the Pentecostal church? And we said, yeah. They said, man, those people are some of the best people. We were trying to protect you. (laughs) They're like, you know, missionary Shirley, Steve Shirley. We're like, yeah, we're building a church with him over another part of town. They said, man, he's done so much. We couldn't, we, whatever you need. I said, can y'all go back and get my buddy? A couple of months after we were there building that church and three or four months later and finally six months and then nine months brother steve Shirley was staying in contact with us he said you won't believe what's happened in that church i said what happened he said every week they're winning people to the lord they're winning people to the lord they're winning people to the lord he said it's cleared out the whole area all the drug lords are left all the houses of ill repute everybody's cleaned out the whole neighborhood is in the church God can make something beautiful out of a wasteland. He can say, I'm going to build a church right here on this spot to show that I'm God. Beautiful. Woo! Hallelujah. The city council contacted the missionary, Brother Shirley, and they said, the only way we used to know how to control that area is we just limited their power. We cut all the lights off, power off. But they said, now they've all moved down there. We're redoing our power schedule. And we have decided we're going to designate more light to that area. (laughs) So you bring spiritual light and the natural light will follow. That's another whole sermon. (laughs) Sometimes you got to just believe God's word. And in the natural world, it looks impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Last year, we were over in Zambia dedicating a church we had a few years ago said we wanted to build a church in zambia and sister 
bathed and got on board. And she said, I'd like to, I'd like to help contribute to that and be something we could do in memory of Herman Bazden and his brother Bill Bazden. And so we contacted the missionary. We said, we want to help build a church up in Ndola. We'd never been to Ndola. It's an area up in the northern part of Zambia, up in the copper region where they, they mine a lot of copper. So he said, okay. So we started funding and he would show me pictures of this and that. And it was going along pretty good. And we were supposed to go the year before last. And they had an election. There was all kind of riots. And they said, it's just too dangerous. We, we wouldn't feel like it'd be safe for you and your family and the others to come down in here. So we're going to postpone it. So finally last year in August when we were in Africa, they had us come up there and, and uh, dedicate this church. And as they were dedicating this church, they probably got some pictures up there that they can show you. This is us standing around on the outside of the church. We're getting ready to dedicate it. That's the pastor on the far right, the missionary standing next to me. This is the church now that stands there in Nandola. And doesn't that look beautiful? This is a plaque that says, thank you to First Pentecostal Church in, in honor of Herman Bazden. This is the inside of the church as we're uh, getting ready to dedicate it unto the Lord and, and all of the people. And it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful facility that uh, they can preach the gospel of Jesus Christ into that area. And while they were preparing for that dedication service, the pastor had prepared some comments. And when he began to tell about what they had gone through to get to this point. I said to Pastor David, I said, is there any way I can get a copy of it? He gave me this copy and I've I've hung on to it. Here's what he says. I won't read all of it. In 2009, we applied for a church plot from Nandola City Council. And after several visits to the council, we were told there was no land left in Labudo, that's the particular neighborhood they're in, for church plots and other similar developments except a dumping site which was within the heart of Labudo compound, and we gladly accepted to be allocated on the dumping site. You want to build a church? You can go to the dump and do it. Knock yourself out. Sadly, the place in question was earlier on allocated to a certain developer who until then had abandoned the place for over 18 years, and the locals had turned it into a dumping site. Ladies and gentlemen, this magnificent building we are dedicating to the glory of God today stands at a once filthy dumping place. But we were determined to clear up the garbage despite the huge cost involved. And within two weeks we were done and we immediately requested the local authority to allow us to construct a temporary building of timber offcuts and, and shifts there as we awaited the formalization of our stay with their express permission to put up a temporary structure. And we shifted our small congregation there. But a week after shifting the place, people started coming and claiming ownership of the plot. Nobody cares about it for 18 years. They're dumping trash on it. But you go to build a church on it and everybody claims they own it now. Isn't that the way the enemy works? But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. They threaten legal redress against us if we remain despondent to their calls or demands. But we fought all the battles and won them. However, a seventh person who came was now the legal owner of the place who abandoned it for over 18 years. She had full title deeds of the plot. She claimed that she went to the U.S. to raise money to build a school. She initially intended to put it up and said that she was now ready to start her project. And the church should excuse her for being gone for 18 years and she was coming to take her land. The church was then dragged to court for illegally settling on her property and she made unsubstantiated claims to the effect. The legal battle was really painfully humiliating and expensive. We received in the process a court injunction to restrain us from further developing the place and having our church meetings there. But the court quickly intervened and allowed us to keep on having church services there. I remember one day coming out of the courtroom beaten up left and right. I didn't understand all these legal battles. I felt like I was in a jungle. I didn't understand. I had almost given up the fight. But thanks be to missionary Reverend Gary Abernathy who lifted up my spirit with timely words of encouragement. Two years later, the court ruled in favor of the church, despite that we had not been given the legal documents to secure or grant our stay there. And the court further ordered the local authority to speedily formalize our stay. And on the 12th of June, 2012, we received our official letter. 16 times we were summoned by the Nandola City Council to go and to answer different charges leveled against us, but the Lord saw us through them all. And then on June 27th of 2012, we started our building project. But a year later, when the building was at window level, and steel pillars already raised or mounted. Another team masterminded by one of the churches around us. Now they're going to get attacked by the other churches. Took us to court again, claiming that half of our building had encroached upon their land. And they demanded the immediate demolition of our building. But the matter was resolved within eight months and we resumed our work. Six months later, 
A team of engineers and unscrupulous city council workers with evil schemes persisted coming out to our plot, claiming that they had been sent by the local authority to rezone our plot. The move that was in fact against the court ruling. This time around, we received eight call outs from various council departments to go and clarify the matter. And in the process, we got eight demolition notices. The fourth and no, the eighth and final one was signed by the town clerk. Watch this whose order could not be stopped or revoked by either the town mayor, district commissioner, or the provincial minister. Doesn't that sound like a story out of the Bible? Nobody can revoke this order. We had seven days to clear everything out on our own or the bulldozer going to come do its work after the expiration of seven days. At this juncture, ladies and gentlemen, we sought the indulgence of the high court into the matter as we now drag the Ndola City Council to court. And through a court injunction, we restrained them from replanting our church plot. And a year later, the court secured our stay here and warned the council of stern action. The city council. If they ever again went against a court ruling over our land. (laughs) A dumping site. The city dump. Nobody cares about it. You go to put a church on it. And you raise up all kinds of spirits. But the high court, ooh, hallelujah, said, don't ever mess with them church people again. (laughs) Henceforth, he said, we have peace at this place. We are unmovable and unshakable. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the church has undergone great trials, persecution and harassment. But despite all that we have faced, we remain united and focused and determined more than ever before. We have not lost our direction, our enthusiasm, our zeal, or our tenacity to work for the Lord. We thank God that all of these excruciating plans and all of the pain of the past has catapulted us to where we are today. God said, I'll make something beautiful out of the ashes of all of your trials. Woo, hallelujah. He goes on to thank First Pentecostal Church in Palm Bay, Sister Bays and Reverend David Myers. And now I just heard this morning, they're planning on building a school next door to church. You say why? Because God can make something beautiful out of all they shall build the old ways that shall raise up the former desolations they shall repair the waste cities the desolations of many generations you thought the stuff you went through was just life god was giving you some ashes that he could make beautiful if you'll just put them on the altar there are three things that make ashes beautiful. The first is that it's a testimony to the greatness of God. How can you explain a little church taking on the city council of a large city in the copper region of Zambia? How do you explain that to where the high court of the land warns the city council, don't mess with these people anymore? (laughs) you tell me that God is not working on behalf of his people and in the midst of all of that in a city we've never been and in a people we've never met God puts it on the heart of this church to help them and he said to me I believe if we'd never gone through the Lord never put that on your heart and we would never had a building there but because the church working together from across oceans Ah. it's a testimony to the greatness of God here's the second thing that makes ashes beautiful it is hope for a human soul that anything can be transformed in the hand of God I don't care if you're a drug addict living under the Melbourne Bridge. He can transform anything in the hand of a mighty God. I don't care if you're a multimillionaire and you've had 12 wives and you own an airplane. God can make something beautiful out of any situation. You've not gone too far, but that God can't save you and make something beautiful out of 
the ash. You may be facing divorce. You may have a child that's strung out on drugs. I've come to tell you, there's beauty that's going to come from those ashes. And finally, the beauty of the ashes is simply this. The blessings of tomorrow are fueled by the bruises of yesterday. The blessings of tomorrow are fueled by the bruises of yesterday. Not in spite of the bruises of yesterday, but literally fueled by the bruises of yesterday. You don't have to just endure your past. You don't have to just cope with your past. God wants to turn your past into something beautiful if you'll put it on the altar. If you'll give it over to him. The reason that the ashes were valuable to God. The reason they were considered holy. The reason he had them wrap them up and take them with all of it was because it came from the altar. And the altar is where the transformation process took place. There's something beautiful about even the remnants of a transformation process. That God says, we're not going to discard it. So ladies and gentlemen, if you'll put your past on the altar, it'll become holy to God. It will become an instrument of praise. And you may come to a Pentecostal service and not understand why people shout in church. It may not be beautiful to you. But that's because you don't know the ashes that it came from. Good God Almighty. You see Brother Reyes running the aisles and you think that crazy guy from Puerto Rico, he must have lost his mind or something. But you don't know the ashes that his praise comes from. You see people stand up and shout and say, glory be to God. And you think they need to learn how to be a little more distinguished. You don't know the ashes that their praise has come from. Somebody claps their hands. Somebody dances before the Lord. Somebody shouts unto God with the voice of triumph. It may have been you, but it's beautiful. The God gets ashes from the altar of sacrifice. It's holy to God. It's beautiful to God. You can remain standing. So you may not understand the worship of the First Pentecostal Church in Indola, Zambia. You may come to that service and think they're all crazy because of the way they worship God. Turn it up loud. Turn it on strong. says I'm trading my sorrows I'm trading my shame and I'm laying it down for the joy of the Lord I'm not running from it any longer I'm just going to lay it down on the altar and I'm going to let the fire of God's spirit I'm going to let it burn it and transform it and give me beauty was nothing but pain I'm 
trading my sickness. I'm trading my pain. And I'm laying it down for the joy of the Lord. I told Sister Baysden, the ashes of the pain of her losing her spouse has become beautiful because there's a church in Nindola where people are worshiping God. I told Sister Masa this morning, the pain of losing Joe and the ashes of that pain is beautiful because there's a medical clinic in Haiti because of that. I don't know what you may be going through today, but I've come to tell you that there's a God that's going to make something beautiful. Out of those ashes. What do you want God to do? Why don't you bring it right now to this altar? What do you want God to do? What is it that you need that only God can do? You got to come on and bring it to the Lord. You got to come on and put it down right now on this altar. You've tried to finagle it on your own. You've tried to deal with it. You've tried to just be strong. This is not the time to be strong. This is a time to bring your sacrifice of praise and put it on this altar right now. Oh, that's beautiful. People coming from all over the building. Make your way down to this altar right now. I want you to put it on this altar and the fire of heaven, the fire of Pentecost is going to come down and it's going to consume your sacrifice and what's going to be left is ashes that are holy unto God. Come on, would you lift your voice right now? It may be a family situation. It may be a sickness in your body. Come on. Let God make something beautiful out of it. That's it, that's it, that's it. I'm putting it all on the altar today. but I feel an unction of the Holy Ghost in this house. And I need you to help me this morning. If it's appropriate, whoever you're standing next to, I want you to turn right now and I want us to pray one for another. I want you, if it's appropriate, to put your hand on their head. I want you to put your arm around their back, whatever you can do, make contact. And I want us to pray the prayer of faith right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's hold off for just a second. I don't want there to be any noise except the prayers and the praises of God's people. My God, there's a transformation happening right now. 